Chaim Shaharazani, and in the news, Israel under attack. JBS continues to cover Israel's ongoing battle with Hamas. At this point, over 4,000 rockets were fired into Israel, and we are informed two more were killed and two seriously injured on Tuesday as a result of those rockets. In addition, as Israel was transferring humanitarian support and supplies into Gaza, one Israeli soldier was injured as Hamas chose to bombard the crossing into Gaza while those trucks were making their way in. Israel's northern border has not been quiet as well. Six rockets were fired from Lebanon toward northern Israel. Most fell inside Lebanon. In response, IDF artillery forces fired toward the sources of the launches. Israeli towns near the border were ordered by the IDF at the time to open shelters. So what's happening on the ground? To shed light on the issue, I am absolutely pleased to have with us on JBS all the way from northern Israel, outside of the city of Naharia, only a few miles from the Israeli northern border, our dear friend, Lieutenant Colonel Reserve Sarit Zahavi, founder and CEO of Alma Research and Education Center. Sarit served for 15 years in the Israel Defense Forces. She holds an MA in Middle East Studies from Ben Gurion University in Be'er Sheva in Israel. She lives with her husband and five children in the village of Kfar Vradim, located in the Western Galilee of Northern Israel. Zahavi is a recognized worldwide expert and authority, an impactful speaker on security issues Israel faces today, not just in the North, but also all around Israel. Sarit, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you very much, good afternoon. So first of all, let me ask you, um, what's the situation where you are? And I want you to relate to both internally and externally when it comes to the riots in mixed cities and what's happening in Gaza, rockets, etc. Well, so um, let's let's begin with the issue of the rockets and artillery. In the north, we didn't have rockets from Gaza. Uh, they didn't get up to the Galilee. Uh, as far as they could get in this round was Tel Aviv and the areas there. Uh, but uh, we did have few incidents of uh, rocket shooting. The, the one you mentioned was the third one actually in the past few days. Uh, of either from Lebanon or from Syria or from somewhere in the border between Lebanon and Syria. Uh, all of them failed. Uh, it looks like nothing happened, but uh, I, I hope that people realize that every shooting incident like this means that people are running for shelters. It means the opening of shelters all around the communities uh, up north and uh, next to the border. It means that it's not routine. That's the bottom line. So what we are saying, yeah. So Sarit, we've had three incidents of uh, firing of rockets from the north into northern Israel. Yes, yes. One fell in the sea, one, three rockets fell in the sea at the first incident. Then we have an incident of few rockets that were launched to the southern part of the Golan. Few of them fell in Israel. Few of them fell in Syria. And we have the incident yesterday that we don't exactly understand where this uh, squad of launching was located. But bottom line is that, as you said, they landed in Lebanon. These were six rockets, and there were alerts in one of these kibbutz uh, on the bottom is Gav Am. Uh, yeah, it does. And we had some incidents, which I didn't mention, which is also very important, of uh, infiltration. The uh, Lebanese and Palestinians from Lebanon tried to infiltrate into Israel, demonstrating rioting next to the border. And in the middle of the night, again, a, a squad of uh, terrorists tried to uh, carry out terrorist, terrorist attack uh, in Metula and they were shot and ran away. Um, and uh, one uh, Hezbollah member was killed during these riots uh, a few days ago. And this morning, Israel shut down a UAV, which is a capability of, you understand, it's not a capability of small Palestinian groups. They may have launched some of the rockets. It's a capability. UAV is a, is a capability of uh, uh, what we call the, the, the axis, meaning the Iranian axis in Syria. Oh, so that that leads me to that question. Um, who exactly is behind those uh, activities on the border? Is it Hezbollah? Is it Iran? Is it uh, other organizations? And what does that mean as far as the potential front for Israel in the north? So first, I, I would like to share with you, uh, and to be very honest with you, that there is a debate here because the information is not clear. We don't have claims of responsibility to all the incidents. And we are lying mostly on uh, experience and evaluations. And in this, uh, there are inside Alma even, we have a lot of debates of who is behind this. 
so we can have like two options, okay? The first option is that uh, in some, some of the incidents are Palestinian groups from Lebanon. In Syria, they, they, they are not there. They, they, can, they don't have these capabilities, as I've said, in this few AVs. But in Syria, in Lebanon at least, and they did that in previous rounds of escalation with Hamas, launching rockets, which usually fail, uh, trying to, to a little bit raise the tension between on the Lebanese border of Israel to create harassment and provocations much more than uh, creating war. Okay, uh, and, and there are also some incidents that were made by uh, proxies of Iran, such as the UAV and probably such as some rocket launching uh, yesterday night, uh, and we and it's not uh, easy to understand what's what what they share, what's in common to all these incidents. Another option is the the one that says there is no coincidence in the Middle East, and all these incidents are uh, connected. Especially when you look at the buses of Palestinians that came from Palestinian refugees in northern Lebanon down to the border to create riots and harassment and to damage the measures on the fence, the, the civilians measures on the fence. Maybe all of this is connected, man. Maybe all of this comes from the same source, which is Iran. And of course, when, when I'm saying that, I cannot ignore the fact that also Hamas is uh, deeply supported uh, by Iran. So uh, there are like two options here and I, I'm trying to be very careful. I don't want to say it is definitely Iran behind all the incidents, but it is definitely Iran behind some of these incidents in the North. And you alluded to the fact that both Hamas and Hezbollah are both proxy organizations of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Is this their revenge for what was reported in foreign media, supposedly with Israeli attacks on uh, Iranian ships? Are they trying to stir the pot in the border? Um, is there an intention here maybe to test Israeli capabilities before a potential confrontation between uh, Israel and Iran or Israel with its northern proxy? What If it is Iran, what is it in your opinion exactly that you're trying to do? Weaken in the state of Israel, that's very easy. The, as long as the Iranians understand, and I guess they still understand, that they cannot uh, create a situation of complete destruction of the state of Israel, they would put a lot of efforts in weakening Israel, weakening the Israeli society from within, weakening the Israeli legitimacy in the international community, and weakening the Israeli resilience when we speak about the artillery threat. And I think this is what the Iranians are trying to gain. Again, but in this specific uh, escalation, I don't think it's only Iran. I think there were more factors that we should take in consideration. Uh, when we speak of Hamas, you said Hamas and Hezbollah as the proxies of Iran, but you know, as, a, as the CEO, I can say that Hezbollah is truly an employee of Iran. No doubt, they, they are getting paid with salaries every month. Hamas is a freelance. So it's a little bit of a different relationship. Uh, it is supported by Iran. One has half not, insurance, the other doesn't. No, I'm just kidding. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not exactly the same. Uh, and that's why Hamas also has its own interest in this escalation, uh, which as, a, as a, a, many people already talked about the issue of the cancellation of the elections by Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, and the, what the linkage that Hamas made between what is happening in Jerusalem in Al-Aqsa and the fact that it is firing rockets toward Israel, this is something that we've never seen before. And it is highly important for the understanding of the position that Hamas, that Hamas want to gain for itself but through this escalation. And in this respect, it achieved what it wanted. It, it managed to, to say, okay, we are representing the interest of the issue of Al-Aqsa. And this is not exactly about Iran. Right. Um, Sarit, I, I want to ask you something else that pertains to Iran. We understand that there is different level of support, but at the end of the day, Hezbollah full support and Hamas is a freelancer, but they're both sponsored, supported by Iran. We understand the destabilizing uh, role that Iran plays in the Middle East. Do you think that what we're seeing now may have any kind of influence on potential US-Israel negotiations, US-Iran negotiations vis-a-vis -vis the sanctions and the nuclear, you know, revival of the nuclear agreement, or uh, those two are two separate paths? Again, most ex experts believe that uh, Iran's interest for now is to keep it calm here. Uh, 
because they want to focus on the negotiation with, with the issue of the coming back to the JCPOA. I am not sure that this is the case. I think that as long as the flames are uh, controllable, as long as this is an escalation which is limited in time, uh, for the Iranians, why not? You know, we create another disturbance, um, and you know, we we we, don't, we didn't lose control. Moreover, if this is an opportunity to put pressure on Israel and to damage again its position in Washington. So I don't see how Iran can lose out of that. It can lose if Hezbollah will be deeply involved, which is not the case yet. Is there a chance that it's going to hurt Iran in the sense that Washington will see that Iran's support for Hamas destabilizes the region and therefore maybe they'll be a bit more wary about providing more you know, funding to Iran using the removal of sanctions or you don't see that happening at all? I wish it was the case. I mean, I wish that... Uh, we would have succeeded in delivering this message that Iran is destabilizing the Middle East and what is happening now, uh, the fact that there are uh, salvos of rockets that were launched, tens of rockets at the same time that were launched to Tel Aviv, uh, it's all it all comes from Iran. Somebody needs to talk about it when they discuss uh, the JCPOA, yes or no. Right. So I wish it was the case, but uh, Hamas, whether Hamas. this is... And Hamas is not hiding that fact. They're actually very proud of the Iranian support. That's the case, right? Yeah, yeah. Why would also Hezbollah? There is no shame anymore in Iranian involvement in the Middle East. This this shame and trying to hide, this is something that belongs to the past. And uh, nobody's hiding that. You can see um, just this weekend, the head of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad uh, went to Lebanon uh, 10 days ago, a uh, Kani the head of Kurds force, the, the one who replaced uh, Soleimani came to Lebanon, a kind of reunion, everybody came to Lebanon uh, in the past 10 days. Um, so no, nobody's hiding the Iranian involvement here. And a lot of people are concerned about the potential new front in the North with Hezbollah. What do you think are the chances that Hassan Nasrallah may decide to launch an attack from his side to support the Palestinian cause? I want to bring up the memories from 2006. Nasrallah didn't make a decision in 2006 to open war against Israel. And 2006 started from an escalation between Israel and Gaza with the kidnapping of Gilad Shalit. We should bear in mind that, okay, a week earlier. And in 2006, uh, after the, the de-escalation, you know, with, between Israel and Gaza, Hezbollah made the decision to kidnap two soldiers, assuming that it will not get them into war. And I think this is exactly the problem, that Hezbollah may want, uh, and Iran may want to raise the tension in the North because it serves their interest. But they do not evaluate that raising the tension will necessarily bring to war. But this UAV that was shot down today was on its way to somewhere. To, to kill Israelis somewhere. What if we had failed to, to intercept it? What, you, we just, okay, this is war in Gaza now? So what you're saying is that even if Hezbollah does not intend to escalate into a, an all-out war, its actions may lead in that direction because the potential harm caused by their deeds, again, it's the... Um, it's a strategic corporal, as we call it in Israel. You know, that UAV may fall somewhere, the damage may be incalculable, and then Israel will find itself in a position where it has to retaliate, and there we go, the snowball of the um, Middle Eastern turmoil. And you're sitting on a barrel of explosive while you have rockets and artilleries that are pointed at Israel from, from all sides, the, you know, from uh, Lebanon, Syria, mainly Lebanon, and, and Gaza. And uh, eventually, I think the interest of the IDF is to get rid of this threat, but, but we don't want to initiate this getting rid of this threat. Right. And we always have this hope that the international community will come together and maybe assist us in getting the threat removed. But we haven't been successful so far in this regard. I, I have to, um, um, I want to just to touch a little bit on the personal, Sarit. We really appreciate the incredible work that you and Alma do on the northern border and the insight that you're able to provide, not just us, but the entire American arena and, you know, a public official, the realization of the challenges, because at the end of the day, whatever happens in Israel does not end 
in, only in Israel. It's always somehow exported globally. We all remember Hamas uh, terrorist uh, suicide bombings of the 90s making their way to the global platform. I want to touch on the personal side. You're in the north of Israel. We have mm-hmm. seen some tensions um, between Arabs who decided to attack Jewish neighborhoods, Jews, Jewish cars, Jewish property. Um, several Jews have been injured. One died as a result of lynching in the city of Lod. You are up there in the north. How is it for you personally? Um, how has it been? Are you actually feeling it? How are the kids? Share, if, you, if you're willing to, please share a little bit with us. I am heartbroken. That's, that's the two words that can describe what we feel in my family and me and my husband. My kids definitely can't understand why all of a sudden I don't let them go out the way they are used to. I don't let them travel to, their father lives in Carmiel. I don't let them travel to their father in buses in, in the evening because I'm afraid. They don't understand. They grew up in an atmosphere of uh, complete uh, security and safety. And they don't, they're not very much involved of what I do. So they don't, I don't tell them and I try not to involve them in this because I don't want to cultivate hate. And, and during all these years that I live in, in the Galilee, I was very proud of the coexistence between Jews and Arabs in the Galilee. I was never afraid to enter any Arab town here in the region, in Acre, in Haifa, all these villages in the, in the north here. I had doctors to my kids and shopping and, and friends and business and all, uh, you know, renovation of the house. All, all the professionals are Arabs uh, and we had amazing, amazing relationship with them. And we are heartbroken from what is happening. And it, it took us a few days to, to make a decision at home of me and my husband, of what do we do? How do we take it from here? Because many Jews said, uh, and I'm not talking about radicals that went out to the streets to beat Arabs. Okay, um, these should be treated, uh, everybody that is uh, violent should be treated the same way. Um, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, you know, normative people that feel that what, what happened? Why? Why this is happening? Why are we afraid to travel on the roads in the north? I couldn't visit my parents in Shavuot Eve because I was afraid to, to cross the roads up north uh, in the evening. And eventually I went only yesterday uh, I told you, uh, but we made a detour in order not to get into any nearby Arab town. This is not a normal situation here, and we didn't experience that in the past 20 years. Um, so it's, it's, I'm not angry, I'm sad that this is the situation. And in our family, eventually, we made a decision to continue to support the coexistence and to continue uh, our relationship with our uh, Arab friends and neighbors. But um, uh, it is not always the easy decision. It's the right decision, but it's not always the easy decision because there are different narratives and, and, and different point of views and different perceptions of reality, which it's not always easy to gap. And, and we listen to each other and we say, are, are you watching the same news? What's going on here? And yet we must continue to listen to each other because we have no other way. We, we have no choice. We live together. Now that none of us is going to disappear. Yeah, but you know, Sarit, I can I hear the disappointment in your voice because while Hamas's missiles fired from Gaza make no differentiation between Arabs and Jews, gays or straight, ultra orthodox or secular, they did indeed kill several Arab citizens as well. Not just within Gaza, rockets that fell in. Not- also in Israel and in Lod. And you also don't expect the torching of synagogues in the Jewish state and Jews being afraid to walk the streets. And uh, we know that some of the casualties were lynch mobbed by dozens of Arabs who just by the, by the very fact that they were Jews were attacked. One of them passed away. The other is, is gonna face long rehabilitation. It's a severe disappointment. My question to you is, I'm sure you have a lot of Arab neighbors and colleagues and friends um, whom you live nearby. Have you heard anything from them? Have they reached out to you in light of what's been happening? Yes, yes. It was like a light in the dark. Uh, yes, when I went to the supermarket in the nearby Arab village, they gave flowers uh, to Jewish buyers. 
Uh, another one who owned the restaurant went out to the street and, and gave flowers to everybody. Um, I have a friend uh, from the nearby Jewish village. She came in Shavuot with her husband and her daughter to visit us. And she listened to my frustration and we had a, a, a deep dialogue about education, about what do you do? First, I don't think any of us here feel that they completely identify with Hamas rockets. I think that it's more identifying with their Palestinian identity. And here, of course, even inside the Israeli society, the Jewish Israeli society in the North, there is a debate. Okay, uh, they consider themselves Palestinians. How do we take it from here? Because eventually they are Israeli citizens. They are not citizens of the Palestinian Authority. Um, can we accept their Palestinian identity? And if we can accept it, in what what level we can accept it? Can we accept Palestinian flags? Can we accept just the fact that they are saying I'm an Israeli and Palestinian? What, what's exactly? I want, to, what can I, we want accept? You, I want to ask you about this because what we've seen just before the war started, you had the majority of the Zionist parties in the Israeli Knesset who said that they're willing to have the Islamic movement as part of their government, regardless whether it's the right-wing bloc, center-right headed by Netanyahu or center-left headed by Lapid, potentially Bennett, the Islamic movement. We've also seen Mansour Abbas, the head of Ram, that part of Islamic movement, visiting the synagogue in Lod and today committing to taking part in renovating the synagogue. So what does that mean that we were, I mean, do you think that the, uh, the Hamas's attacks completely reversed that trend? Uh, has it slowed oh. it down or where does that stand? We are at, at, not even in the middle, at the beginning of a process of integration of the Arabs in Israel into the Israeli society. And since we are only at the beginning, there are tons of problems from all sides, from any way you look at that. And uh, since we are at the beginning, you, said, you mentioned politics and, and the issue of the, giving the Arabs to be part of government, yes or no, yes, which is a huge debate here in Israel. This is a process. Uh, the fact that Arabs have no home in uh, Zionist parties, it's definitely a problem because Arabs that are not identifying with the religious agenda of the Islamic movement of Mansour Abbas, who would they vote for? But it's, Mansour it's a great question. But Sarit, Mansour Abbas, I think at some point transitioned from just the Islamic movement into a new outlook on Israeli politics. Up until no, it's just, it's just been pragmatic. It didn't yeah. abandon the, the agenda of the Islamic movement. He's yeah, totally but, part of that. But we haven't seen such pragmatism from the, uh, from the joint yeah. Arabs, which is truly unique, right? And yes, and again, if you ask Arabs that uh, went through the uh, process of, uh, you know, detaching themselves from religion and religious, they cannot vote to the Islamic movement, you know, it's like I would vote to ultra-Orthodox Haredim, I would never do that, it's not who I am, and, and they cannot vote to the Islamic movement, so who would they vote for if they want to see a stable government in Israel and they support, you know, all of, all of these things a stable government would do, but they don't support the Islamic movement. There is no home for Arabs in the Zionist party. This is, I think this is part of the problem, but we are at the beginning of a process. And since we are only at the beginning, you see a small percentage of voices that are talking for the coexistence. And, and it, it, it feels like most people are still feeling Palestinians in a way that it's very difficult. You know, let's talk of one contradiction. They want to see police inside the villages, the Arab villages, in order to take care of the crime inside the Arab villages, or they want to burn the police stations in the Arab villages because they represent the state of Israel. What do they want? I'm not sure they know. And, and it's a process, and I beautifully understand. Said, beautifully said, Sarit. I think that's exactly it. That's exactly the dilemma. For years, they've called for increased uh, police intervention to reduce the crime level within the Arab sector, and now you're upset. I mean, it's you just depicted it. I just want to put one last question before we go. How are the kids doing? Like, how are they <laughs> feeling now, both on the path of coexistence and with the rockets coming from Gaza? How are you coping with it with them? Because I'm sure that, you know, you're very much uh, steeped in the geopolitics, the quagmire of the Middle East, but it's tough to expose our children to those realities. How is that going? Since I have, uh, you know, we are like, uh, five kids, he's mine and ours. So it's really fair what the amount of exposure 
uh, you get to all these conflicts. So we have one boy who is a soldier. And um, so, so he has his own point of view. He's already grown up. I have a two teenaged who completely don't understand Mommy, what is your problem? Nothing is happening. We are safe. Everything is good. Let us continue our life. Uh, eventually, we ended up with COVID. Let us continue our regular life. What's the problem? They don't understand what's the problem. And you know what? In a sense, I'm happy for that. Uh, the little one, Alma, uh, she is much more exposed to what I do, and she's more interested. So she's trying to understand. I, I, I try to, to explain them because I thought it, it's bad for them just to, you know, um, get in fractions of information. So I try to explain them a little bit, but it's a dilemma. How do you explain everything that is happening when there is no one narrative? That there is a debate about facts, and when you don't, and especially when you don't want to create a situation of hate, you want to create a situation of complete loyalty to the state of Israel. I want my children to go to serve in the army wherever, um, because I think that that you know that's our duty. We cannot uh, live here without uh, defending our country. Um, and on the other hand, I don't want them to hate. I want them to grow up. Uh, um, promoting coexistence again because we have no other choice. Sarit, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for giving me the place. And please stay safe and stay um, healthy and happy, you and your family, and keep an eye for us on the North. We'll get back to you shortly, as I imagine. We always love hearing your voice on JBS and in the general American Jewish and American public opinion sphere, as it's very insightful and meaningful for people to understand, because the Middle East is a very complicated place. Thank you very much and appreciate the great work you and the Alma team do today and every day. And to all, I'd like to say thank you for watching. Stay safe and stay healthy. I'd like to thank our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's managing director, Dara Golub, our technical manager, Michael Paley, transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to our wonderful producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. For JBS, I'm Shahar Azani. Thank you all for watching. Shalom and Lehitraut.